Hello, everyone. Welcome to session 11 of LTEC 676. Quiet. Greetings from Chicago. I'm here for the AECT convention. AECT, of course, is the Association for Educational Communications and Technology, which is a professional association of instructional designers, educators, and professionals who provide leadership and advise policymakers in order to sustain a continuous effort to enrich teaching and learning. Some of you may even be attending the convention virtually, and I know others of you may be involved with our local chapter of AECT High. If you have time and the inclination, I certainly encourage everyone to get involved with AECT and to take advantage of the many learning and networking opportunities it affords. Now, I want to start this video with an interesting case of educational technology that unfolded in Hawaii in 2020. This was a big local story, and it even made the national news. I'm bringing it up now because I think it is a worthwhile case study for this class to consider, one with an obvious local connection. So what's the story? Well, in 2020, in the midst of the pandemic, there was quite a bit of controversy around the DOE's use of a digital learning platform or program called Acellus. Now, according to the vendor of this platform, Acellus was an interactive learning accelerator. It combines technology and learning science to help students master content, learning more effectively and efficiently. And according to reports and statements made by the DOE, the program was used by nearly 80,000 students across 188 public schools in Hawaii. Many students were using the platform because of COVID-19. And according to the DOE superintendent at the time, the Acellus Learning Accelerator was selected based on curriculum availability to fulfill course needs, cost effectiveness, implementation timeline, and consultation with schools already utilizing the program. Now, the controversy around the platform began when members of the community started raising concerns about the appropriateness and quality of the platform's content. Multiple examples of questionable content were reported to the DOE, shared on social media, and sent to local reporting outlets such as the Honolulu Civil Beat. Just to give you an idea, here are some examples of that questionable content. So here's a multiple choice item asking if Li is from the country of China, what kind of food might he like? Pie, seafood, or burgers? Here's another example of an Acellus lesson, stating that Hawaii is a group of islands in the Pacific that was discovered by Europeans in 1778. In the article linked below, the reporter, Su Von Lee, noted that this lesson compresses centuries of complex Hawaiian history into a few brief statements, including that following the bombing of Pearl Harbor in 1941, the Hawaiians were interested in becoming a state. The controversy about this digital platform even made it to the national level, with this story in the Wall Street Journal. This story was titled G is for Gun and was written in response to this Acellus lesson. I wanted to draw your attention to this controversy, not to poke fun at the Acellus platform or to criticize the Department of Education, but instead to highlight it as a highly relevant example of the social and ethical issues involved in educational technology. As students in this class, I encourage you to think about how this story involving a particular instance of educational technology aligns with the various themes we've been covering this semester. For example, how might this story have played out differently if the DOE had used an ethical matrix to facilitate discussion and dialogue around what technologies to adopt in the wake of the COVID-19 situation? 
That's an interesting question to contemplate. Okay, that's enough about this particular story. It's time to move on. Last week, we started theme four, which is focusing on giving voice and disempowering structural inequalities. Of course, we began that theme by talking about the downtown school described in the first chapter of Christo Sims' book, Disruptive Fixation. In that chapter, we learned that the downtown school was founded as a reaction to the problem that we're living in a radically new, interconnected, technologically saturated, and unequal era and the idea that our inherited educational institutions are woefully out of date. According to Sims, the proposed solution to these problems was to start a radically new kind of school, one with a specialized curriculum designed for today's digital and tech-savvy kids. So what school is Sims talking about? Well, the name of the school is called Quest to Learn, and it's located in New York City. As shown in the picture, Quest to Learn is a public 6 through 12 school with an innovative educational philosophy developed by top educators and game theorists at the Institute of Play. I encourage you all to go to the Quest to Learn website to learn a little bit more about it. The school itself is actually quite fascinating. One of the co-founders was Katie Salen, pictured here in the bottom right. The school Quest to Learn leverages game-based learning, which they define as carefully designed student-driven systems that are narrative-based, structured, interactive, and immersive. As you can see here, part of the pitch of the school is the idea that games are beneficial to the learning process. In terms of resources, Sims notes that Quest to Learn was as well supported as just about any experimental new public school could hope to be. It received millions of dollars from a prestigious philanthropic foundation. It spent more than $200 million on related research projects and interventions focused on digital media and learning. The school had more laptops than students. It had the latest hardware and software for making media technologies. And it also had one of only two semi-immersive embodied learning environments in the world. In addition to all that hardware and software, it also had teachers, administrators, and staff, as well as an in-house team of media technology designers and curriculum specialists. Now, if we connect this back to what we've been talking about in terms of equity and equality, the downtown school really started with unparalleled inputs and processes. Recall that inputs are what schools start with when educating students. This includes financial, physical, and human resources. Processes, on the other hand, include what happens within schools when students are educated. And, as you might imagine, Quest to Learn was designed to completely disrupt traditional ideas of schooling. Essentially, it set out to answer the question, what would happen if you completely reconfigured all of the inputs and processes? of a school. There was a lot of excitement around Quest to Learn when the school first opened. It had incredible publicity. Local, national, and international news organizations produced hopeful stories about the new school. Sims writes, the downtown school was celebrated as one of the most innovative and promising attempts to redesign schooling in the first decades of the new millennium, one that swept away antiquated educational conventions and replaced them with an innovative and in improvisational culture that was more akin to a Silicon Valley startup than a traditional public school. Sims also notes that the downtown school was a centerpiece in an ambitious new philanthropic initiative that aspired to reinvent educational systems for the 21st century. The downtown school was covered by CNN and the New York Times, and I've linked to these articles in their corresponding videos in Canvas, so be sure to check those out. Now, you might be asking yourself, why are we focusing on this? What is the connection of the downtown school to social and ethical issues? Well, the downtown school represents an excellent case study of the intersection of society, education, and technology, which is why Sims, of course, decided to write about it. Importantly, the downtown school offered its cutting-edge educational experience to students from any background. And Sims notes in his book that the new school would equitably and engagingly prepare young people for the increasingly connected and competitive world and job market of the 
21st century. Could a school with all the innovation and resources of Quest to Learn eliminate differences in educational opportunity? What would the outputs of a school like Quest to Learn be? Could such an initiative overcome the compounding inequalities noted by Linda Darling Hammond? In other words, is this a story with a happy ending? Sims is pretty clear and upfront that the results of this innovative experiment are actually very, very mixed. He writes on page three that long before I stopped my field work in 2012, the downtown school had become much like the schools it had been designed to replace. It was helping to remake many of the problems that it had been designed to remedy. A little later in the chapter, Sims argues that his book is about how genuine frustrations with the status quo and understandable yearnings for social change are converted again and again into seemingly cutting-edge philanthropic interventions that not only fall short of reformers' aspirations, but also help sustain and extend the status quo as well as its problems. Yikes, that doesn't sound like the results people were expecting. Now, now by the second chapter, Sims really zooms out from the downtown school to focus on what he calls outsized expectations. He zooms out both in scope and time to focus on society at large, which we've talked about all semester. This is the idea that education is situated inside of society and that technology is also situated inside of society. And we've also talked about the societal ills or problems, the conditions or behaviors that have negative consequences for large numbers of people, such as poverty and inequality, and how these exist under the surface of education and technology. Now, importantly, Sims argues, drawing on earlier work by Tayek and Cuban, that education often becomes a target. He writes, repeatedly, Americans have followed a common pattern in devising educational prescriptions for specific social or economic ills. And this recurring tendency to translate social, political, and economic concerns into educational problems and solutions has led to a situation in which public education has been asked to solve many problems that are far beyond its reach. In short, Sims and the researchers he's citing believe education is often expected to solve society's ills, and Sims believes that those problems are actually well beyond the scope of education itself. This is not to say that education is not important or can't improve lives. It's simply to say that the expectation placed on the education system over and over again are unrealistic. In short, because education is a subcomponent of a larger system, it is unlikely that it will be able to adequately address the underlying problems of that larger system. So the question for all of us in this class is to consider this. Do we agree with the idea that public education is tasked with solving problems that are far beyond its reach? And secondly, how does technology fit into this equation? Does technology make it more or less likely for education to achieve its goals and address societal problems? Those are two questions we'll be contemplating in the weeks ahead. Okay, everyone, we're out of time for this week. Have a great week, and I'll see you in Canvas.